This is your Daily Detroit for Thursday, February 14th, 2019. I'm Jer Stays, and love is in the air. <laughs> Indeed it is. I'm Sven Gustafsson. Today's show covers a lot of ground, so try to keep up, will you? The historic Lee Plaza is one step closer to redevelopment. Bob Seeger announces a Detroit stop on his farewell tour. And Ryan Landau of staffing agency Repurpose joins us to talk about the cost of living in Detroit versus other cities and the kinds of jobs available around town right now. That and more right after we pay a bill or two. Today's episode is brought to you in part by our friends at Milo Digital. Milo Digital is a full-service digital marketing agency that engineers quality results through data and innovative strategies. Learn more at milodetroit.com. The historic Lee Plaza is a step closer to being renovated. As we broke the news here on Daily Detroit a few months ago, the former hotel at West Grand Boulevard near Linwood got new plexiglass windows to seal up the structure from the weather. As we're now learning, that's a sign something might be happening soon. The city of Detroit announced today plans to sell the building to a joint venture of the Roxbury Group and Ethos Development Partners. The 1.7-acre site would be sold for $350,000 with city council's approval. The property opened in 1927. It sat vacant for more than two decades. What's the plan for Lee Plaza? Right now, developers envision 180 new residential units and some retail as part of a $50 million redevelopment. The project is also expected to set aside at least half of its apartments for residents who earn $40,000 or less. Construction is planned to start as early as 2021. The Roxbury Group has a record of redevelopment in the city, including the Metropolitan Building in downtown Detroit. One of the Ethos Group's signature projects was the Michigan Bell Building, a former telephone switch center near the Lodge Freeway. That's the one that had the giant Yellow Pages phone book sign on the top. The Bell Yellow Pages talks when your fingers do the walking. Cool, doctor. We make emergency calls. Calling can save you time and energy. Mrs. Murphy? Pool doctor? You recognize my voice. Get the yellow pages talking. We make emergency calls. Let your fingers do the walking. A new Michigan law that took effect Wednesday means that you might need to be a bit more watchful while driving. The move over law means that if you see emergency lights, you need to move over one lane if possible and slow down 10 miles an hour below the posted speed limit. This includes what you'd normally think as emergency vehicles, police, fire, and ambulances, but it also includes garbage trucks, tow trucks, maintenance vehicles, and utility vehicles with amber lights on. The law applies to all roadways in Michigan. The fine is $400 for violating the law. The first shots have been fired in Michigan's new era of divided state government. On Thursday, the Republican-led state Senate voted to reject Governor Gretchen Whitmer's recent executive order restructuring Michigan's environmental department. Republicans objected to Whitmer's move doing away with industry-friendly panels they established a year ago to oversee environmental rules and permitting. The GOP-led House last week adopted its own resolution to overturn Whitmer's order. The panels include officials from the oil and gas industries and other businesses. Republicans say that's to help guard against overzealous environmental regulations. Whitmer says the panels merely add bureaucracy and interfere with her goals of strengthening drinking water and other protections in the wake of the Flint water crisis and PFAS contamination. Whitmer has asked Attorney General Dana Nessel, a fellow Democrat, for a legal opinion on whether the panels conflict with federal clean air and water laws. The governor is expected to sign a revised executive order soon. There are updates on the new garden project on Belle Isle to be designed by world-renowned Dutch landscape designer Piet Udolf. He's done projects around the world, including on New York's High Line and in Chicago. The one-acre-plus installation will be located near the Nancy Brown Carolyn Tower. That's within walking distance of the conservatory, and it's becoming a real thing. More than 18,000 plants are being ordered for the first planting in September of 2019. Most of the plants are from local growers in Michigan. Bid packages to select the landscaping contractors to help with the garden installation are going out later this month. The contractors will help with some of the heavier work, including preparing the soil to make it suitable for planting. 
The project will cost around $4 million to complete, and the group says they're on track with fundraising. You can learn about volunteer opportunities at udolfgardendetroit.com, and of course, we'll have a link in the show notes. Jerry, I got to say, as a green thumb, uh, I can't wait till the uh, growing season gets here. I can't wait to start digging in some dirt, some dirt and uh, I definitely want to try to go out and, and help out uh, planting in this garden. Yeah, the renderings and some of the imagery that's come out on the early stages covering the story. I've been following it since last winter, going over to the uh, Flynn Pavilion for a big meeting around that kind of stuff. It's gorgeous. We're just, this is something that it's going to be a, a huge tourist draw. This guy is, I, it seems super niche. And if you haven't heard of him, you know, you'd be like, well, who is this guy? But among gardening folks, among. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, if, if anyone's been to the High Line, I mean, that is just an absolutely incredible project, the way that has transformed that neighborhood. Uh, and it's been a huge, as you said, tourist draw for New York. This will be an added diamond uh, on Belle Isle for sure. If you're a rambling man or just want to go against the wind, you're in luck, Detroit. Or maybe if you're just down on Main Street. Bob Seger has added 12 new cities to his farewell tour, and the Motor City is one of the stops. Well, technically it's Clarkston, because the concert will be on Thursday, June 6th, up at DTE Energy Music Theater. Seeger has been touring the country since last November. This is his final tour after a career spanning five decades. The additional tour dates beyond Detroit include stops in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Charleston, South Carolina, and Bristow, Virginia. Appropriately, Detroit will be his final stop for the man who was part of the city's vibrant garage rock scene of the 1960s. Seeger went on to become a fixture of Detroit area radio in the 70s and 80s. WRIF is still a remarkable radio station. Baby! Tickets go on sale next Friday, February 22nd at 10 a.m., his fan club members get first dibs with pre-sales on Tuesday, February 19th. Daily Detroit is brought to you in part by Bamboo Detroit. With an inclusive community, flexible modern offices, classes, and networking events, Bamboo Detroit helps entrepreneurs and innovative companies launch, land, or expand in Detroit. Become one of their more than 400 members today and get in touch with Amanda at BambooDetroit.com. A new mire will be opening in Royal Oak. It'll be part of a larger development at 13 Mile and Woodward near Beaumont Hospital. The Royal Oak Daily Tribune reports that a smaller format mire, about 40,000 square feet, will be going into the redone shopping plaza. New Order Coffee, Wahlburgers, and a dance studio, along with many others, will be joining mire at the development. The smaller mire will focus on fresh groceries. There's a full-service mire about two and a half miles away, off of Coolidge, north of 14 Mile. We'll have a link to the full Royal Oak Daily Tribune story with more details in the show notes. Amazon has canceled plans to build a second headquarters, known as HQ2, in New York City. Why are we talking about it here? Well, remember, Detroit had a huge push with a ton of effort put toward attracting the same thing. It never happened. There was strong backlash in New York, which is already having problems supporting its residents with its existing infrastructure. Many local politicians there lined up against the project, and Amazon called them out specifically in its statement, which reads in part, and I quote, A number of state and local politicians have made it clear that they oppose our presence and will not work with us to build the type of relationships that are required to go forward with the project we and many others envisioned in Long Island City, end quote. The project would have brought 25,000 jobs and $27 billion in tax revenue, but also included nearly $3 billion in tax breaks and other incentives. That fueled strong opposition, including from people who have become national figures like freshman Congresswoman Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. Amazon says it will soldier on with plans to build the other half of its HQ2 just across the Potomac from Washington, D.C., but will not resume looking for an alternate location for the New York portion. As a reminder, Detroit didn't make the top 20 contenders for HQ2 despite reportedly offering $4 billion in incentives. But Jer, was it a good thing to go through this process, do you think? Well, yes, to a degree. I mean, cooperation isn't a strong suit of Detroit area leaders, and Amazon does their homework, and frankly, they probably already knew this. Sure. But this got local leaders uh, on the same page, at least for a little bit. Although afterward, I got to say, there was the standard finger pointing and denials around the project around old lines. Remember with Mark Hackle and... 
the mayor, Mayor Duggan, and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, transit supposedly had nothing to do with it. Nothing, supposedly. It also showed who really leads big plans like this. Uh, you know, from media reports, from talking to folks it, folks, it was the Dan Gilbert team. They were the ones who really leaned in. And I mean, you know, I think we both, you know, we both have roots. We've worked in corporate Detroit. Uh, and one of the reasons why you see Gilbert and there's a few other people, you think about Roxbury Group, the platform, we've talked about them, why they start to kind of run the table. It's because they put in the people and the effort to lean into things, right? They they belly up to the table, so they end up being the ones who de facto make things work. And since then, you've also seen Gilbert do even more on political issues. Remember that interview I had with one of their uh, government affairs folks about the stuff with car insurance? Yeah. That's something you didn't see before the Amazon bid. It seems like it really emboldened their organization to get involved with stuff. Yeah, it's not so something you typically see business leaders in Detroit, you know, uh, attaching themselves to those kinds of controversial topics, basically. Uh, I think it raises another question, though. Um, should we, Detroit, be trying to woo these massive super projects like Amazon HQ2? I tend to think that we should direct our resources and our efforts to homegrown stuff. There is so many, There are so many great uh, people around here, ideas that happen, but I can't tell you how many times I've seen people kind of stymied by the culture here, and then they go to another city and they just knock it out of the box. And then they come back and then they get that kind of affirmation when I kind of feel like if we had a little bit stronger culture around entrepreneurship, we could do more things. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think we should spend uh, all this incentive money that we're ready to cough up would be much better uh, put to use building up our own uh, city and region. I mean, you know, last I checked, we've got major uh, shortcomings around like educational attainment in our region, our our roads as we've been talking almost nearly every show lately uh, are a, a disaster. Um, and, you know, the leadership in our region has not been great over the past half of a century. Um, I mean, you, you've you tried this statistic out many times that since uh, 1970, Detroit's, the metro Detroit population has basically stayed flat while the rest of the country has grown 60% or so. Uh, by staying the same, what, you know, what that means is we're, you know, for years we were it was Oakland County stealing companies from Detroit. And and in more recent years, that's gone the other way. You know, Detroit's attracting companies like Quicken from the suburbs. Um, you know, another glaring example is in recent weeks, we've seen the news coming out of Wisconsin about Foxconn, which is ding, 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 another, uh, you know, big mega project that Michigan bid on to try to get, right? And that was, I think, another project with like something three to $4 billion in huge, incentives. Yeah. yeah, just obscene. Um and, you know, Foxconn is basically turning around saying, yeah, we're probably not actually going to make the flat screens there, we're not manufacturing jobs. It's going to be more research and development. So I, that's going to probably, who knows where that ends up, if it ends up with anything at all. We need to do a better job, to your point, of just building up more of our hometown industries and, and encouraging entrepreneurship here, building up our region so that it becomes a place that, hey, more people want to come here because there are jobs and opportunities. Well, and incentives are addicting to politicians because it gives them ribbon cuttings and it gives them openings to take pictures at. And it's something that it looks like they're affecting the progress. The thing is, is incentives don't make the decision. Incentive, they don't sit there going, it's the incentive package that gets me over the top. That's kind of the icing on the cake. The thing is about this, though, is that almost every single other city, county, state in the country it's offering these buckets of incentives and if that's the case how do you stop it right because everybody is addicted to it and if everybody's doing it and you don't do it what about the other folks yep. uh two two things really quick we had an old podcast episode devoted entirely to breaking down uh detroit's hq2 bid we'll link to that on daily detroit uh jer also sorry to bust you man but the word is addictive not addicting i hear it all the time it's like a new thing but i you know i'm a grammarian how can i do well, this is part of why you're a wonderful addition to this team, even though sometimes I... You want to strangle me? Yes. With love. It's Valentine's Day, so it's with love. All right. I am rejoined by Ryan Landau from Repurpose. He is uh, one of the wise men that we talked to about what's happening in the job scene in Metro Detroit. Ryan, welcome back to Daily Detroit. Jared, thanks for having me. Happy to, happy to be around. So... 
I understand that you have new data around cost of living comparisons between Detroit and different cities. I know that your company sits in an interesting place and that you're hiring for a lot of technology companies, startups, all kinds of folks, and in different places, but specifically around Detroit and Metro Detroit. What are some of the things that you found? So always doing kind of cost of living, you know, kind of assessments. And what we see from, you know, a candidate perspective here in Michigan, I would say there's three regions that people are looking to move back from. One being San Francisco, two being Chicago, and then three being New York. So those are the the three kind of top locations people are coming from to Detroit. And they always ask about salaries. That is like a very common thing and happy to share information on that. But they always want to know, like, where are the best places to live? Um, how much does that cost? Where can I get a beer? And so on and so forth. And so our team has been collecting some data on that and happy to share like specific numbers of that's of interest. For sure. What are some of the top line numbers? Yep. So top line numbers. So first I'm like, hey, where is the best place to live? Um, and, and how much does that cost? So for about a thousand square foot apartment here in downtown Detroit, the average rent is about a thousand bucks for a one bedroom here in downtown Detroit. And then we compare that to San Francisco. And we're looking, if you had a one bedroom apartment in San Francisco, how much does that cost? That's about $4,000. So there's a pretty big difference between paying $1,000 a month in rent and paying four k a month in rent. That's specific, like one line item that we saw, kind of getting like a basic lunch. What is the difference in cost in getting a lunch in San Francisco and here in Detroit? Here specifically in Detroit, average lunches range about $12 and then average lunches range about $16 in San Francisco. Wow. It's interesting how those little things all tend to add up. Are, are you getting any kind of beat as you're hiring folks, why people are choosing Detroit when they're making the move here? Yeah, I I think it's because of a couple things. Like why Detroit? One, because I think it's like an up and coming scene and people are like, all right, I'm in San Francisco. It's already saturated. There are so many companies. There are so many people. I want to be a bigger fish in a smaller town. One reason. And then we also see it's because of like life stage. So maybe someone moved away. They lived in San Francisco or one of the coastal cities for a while. And maybe they want to come back because they just got married. They're thinking about or just had a first kid and they want to be close to family. So I would say those are kind of the top two reasons that we see and why people are coming back to Michigan. That's really interesting stuff. And of course, we'll have more of that data up on dailydetroit.com. Another thing I wanted to talk to you about was all the changes that have been happening in the automotive industry, specifically, you know, Ford, General Motors, others. They're doing a lot of shifts with their workforce, but we're also hearing that there's a lot of demand for different kinds of workers and that although those companies may be shedding jobs in one way, a lot of those folks may have the opportunity to find something different going forward. Do you have any kind of insight on that? I mean, it's quite interesting. You see kind of, you know, Ford and and GM kind of reducing numbers. But then on the flip side, you see companies that like we're working with, one specifically a company called Integral and then another one called May Mobility. And I actually think May Mobility today raised about $22 million. Um, So it's kind of funny um, seeing the opposite worlds happen, these kind of big legacy companies compared to these startups. Again, both focusing in the automotive uh, you know, world, but these kind of companies between Integral and uh, May Mobility are really focusing on the mobility world, thinking about autonomous vehicles, thinking about technology for tomorrow and you know that's going to continue only to get bigger and bigger it seems like the line between what is an automotive job and what is a technology job is blurring yeah it's blurring and you know it's interesting times because when you think about the people that were originally working at gm are very different than the original people that are starting kind of these technology companies in the mobility space and so really fundamentally you know they're in a similar industry but starting completely from like different from from a culture perspective and from the type of team members that they're attracting. Are you seeing that maybe some of these companies are starting to see that maybe as they've been growing, that they need some of that, maybe that industry expertise that people can offer? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think some of these bigger companies are, uh, you know, kind of starving for that, you know, startup talent and that startup mentality. So I would say, I mean, a few jobs that we see all the time that are like, 
high in demand are everything from robotics engineers to specifically like software engineers. So in the grill is a company I mentioned, May Mobility. You see Google has a huge presence here in Novi, specifically through their autonomous vehicle arm called Waymo. There's quite a few organizations that are growing quickly here in Metro Detroit. Well, that that's definitely good news to hear. And uh, Ryan, if people want to learn more about what you're doing or take a look at the listings you've got going on, where can people visit? People can come check us out at repurpose.co. So if you're an individual that's looking for a new startup job, we would love to help you. Or if you're a company looking to hire kind of this new age talent, uh, we'd love to help you also. So that's just repurpose.co. That's it for your Daily Detroit. Here's where we do our customary thanks because it's Thursday. It's the end of the week as far as our podcast episodes are concerned. Thanks to Randy Walker for staying up with us late working on our award entries. Cheyenne Nosserini for editing segments and for putting together City 5. Nuri Gojai, our spirits advisor, and Bob and Dave from Podcast Detroit. And of course, thank you for listening. I'm Jer Stays. I'm Sven Gustafson. Take care of each other. We'll see you around Detroit. You're listening to the Podcast Detroit Network. Visit www.podcastdetroit.com for more information.